and I will rise among the saints. My gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. He shall return in robes of white. The blazing sun shall be. song are just so amazingly powerful and they tell the story. It starts by saying, I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. Then it says, then on the third at the break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. O oh, trampled death, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. And the song goes on. Talks about the fact that he's coming back one day. I'm convinced that all of history centers around this person, Jesus. All of history. The entire Bible, of course, points that direction. From Genesis 1-1 to the very end, it's all about Jesus, but Jesus was that pivotal person in all of history that makes it possible for us to enter into a relationship with our Creator, and that's why He means so much to us. Today, I want us to take a few minutes just to reflect on the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus as our Savior as we take communion together. Jesus was with His disciples. He was eating the last meal he would have with them, a Passover meal, and he held up the bread and he said, this is my body, broken for you. It was unleavened bread. I mean, it, it didn't have yeast in it. Jesus was saying he was the sinless son of God, breaking his body for us. And then he held up the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant or agreement in my blood. Drink this in remembrance of me. And what was the agreement? What was the covenant? What was the promise? That if we put our trust in the risen Lord Jesus Christ, we will have eternal life. And if you put your trust in him today as you take the elements today, just be mindful of what Jesus did for you. You take the bread, you're taking of Christ who died and was buried for you. When you take of the cup, you're saying, I'm claiming that promise that you made. And of course, Jesus rose again from the dead. He's a living savior. The resurrection proves that God accepted the payment that was made on our behalf. And we do hope that some, maybe even in considering communion, would maybe find Jesus for the first time because he is the savior of the world. We can't fix our sin problem. We need a deliverer, a savior. Jesus was the sinless one who took upon himself all of our sin. He was executed in your place and mine, and he died rose again, God accepted the payment made on your behalf and mine, and we just need to reach out to Jesus by faith. God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, 
but have eternal life. Let's go ahead and pray, and I encourage you to prepare your own heart as you get ready to take communion, and when your own heart is ready, uh, then go ahead and partake. Father, we are so grateful for your son, Jesus. It's just so remarkable, your plan, to send your son into this world to suffer unjustly, to be crucified, uh, just a horrible death, so that we might know you one day, so that we might be in your presence one day. And we look forward to that time when we'll bow before you, where every knee will confess you as Lord. And in the meantime, oh Lord, we look forward to finding joy in Christ because he really is the center, the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to you except through him. Amen. confess that I've been a criminal stolen your breath and sang my own song Lord I confess that I'm far from innocent these shackles I wear I bought on my own Scarlet sins had a crimson cost You nailed my debt to that old rugged cross An empty slate at the empty grave Thank God that stone was rolled away. Lord, I confess that I've been the prodigal made for your house, but walked my own road. Then Jesus.
robes draped over the ashes a wide open tomb where there should be a casket the children are singing and dancing and laughing the father is welcoming this is our homecoming roses in bloom pushed up from the embers rivers of tears from good times remember families are singing and dancing and laughing the father is welcoming final homecoming. I wouldn't mind if it were today. And about the rest of you. You know, everyone these days um, seems to be looking for a secret or the secret of some kind. You know, something out there that, you know, you've just got to have because it's kind of the secret thing. For example, uh, you know, there are products out there that maybe are based on a plant that grows on the other side of the planet. And supposedly, this has secret properties. If you eat this particular plant, you'll live to be 100. And as proof, they'll look at all these people that live in that area and that, that part of the world. And they say, see, they live to be in their mid to upper 90s and low 100s. And so you need this secret. Or it could be anything else. Like, um, I am follically challenged. It means bald. And there are a lot of people that make certain promises and certain secret ingredients that if you, if you use this lotion on your hair or this shampoo or you take this particular supplement, you know, it's the secret to stopping hair loss. And as proof, they'll have pictures of two people, one, well, the same person, but they have no hair here and suddenly they have a head full of hair and it, it sure looks kind of convincing, you know, and I think, well, I want that secret. I could certainly use that secret. Of course, there are lots of secrets out there related to weight loss products, you know, some kind of plant that grows in the Amazon basin. You just got to have this particular thing, or sometimes it's a, a secret approach, you know, something that's just come to light, the secret of intermittent fasting, for example, or, or the keto diet or something like that. And you know, oftentimes they'll show a before and after picture and then there'll be a little of an asterisk by this one that says, results are not typical. Now, my point this morning is not to evaluate the claims of these different products. In fact, I believe that some of them actually work. Uh, I do think that there are even some hair products that if I had had a shot at taking those earlier, they might have actually helped. I don't know. But I do want to talk about this allure, or the lure of, a secret. That when we know that there's like a secret out there, it's like we, we want in. We don't want to miss out on some secret out there. And, and oftentimes people will use this idea of a secret to hook people, you know, to lure them in. And this is even true in the Christian world. I see ministers who talk about the secret of the seed, 
or the secret of the sower, plant your seed with us and God will multiply it. That's the secret. In order for you to have prosperity, you have to give away. I know someone that I believe died in poverty because she listened to that and gave away her money because she was expecting a windfall. And I talked with her about it and I said, you know, sometimes ministers even make promises that God doesn't agree to keep just because they made that promise. But there are a lot of secrets out there, and if there's a secret, we kind of want, kind of want to know what it is. Well, today I want to look at a real secret, a biblical secret, a secret that the Apostle Paul talks about. Uh, today we're going to wrap up our series, Finding Joy in Uncertain Times. We've been looking at the book of Philippians, which is the book of joy. The Apostle Paul wrote the book under not the best circumstances, but he, as we'll see in a minute, had learned a secret a secret to finding joy, but we've looked at a variety of points in this book about how to find joy. We talked about joy that comes just through the gospel message. I mean, the word gospel means good news, and it is good news. Again, I make appeal to anyone out there, if you have not turned to Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, that, that is good news, that your sins will be removed as far as the east is from the west, the Bible says. We talked about the joy that comes from relationships, that starting with our relationship with God, but also with other people. If we're not right with other people, we all know it steals our joy. We talked about the joy that comes from obeying God. I think sometimes we think I can live differently than what God says is good and right and expect to be happy. I don't think it works that way. We talked about the joy associated with not focusing on the past, especially your failures, but focusing on the present and the future with Christ. And then last week, Arch talked about the joy that comes from being rightly related to God. He talked about right praying. In other words, prayer with thanksgiving and prayer with faith. And he talked about right thinking, that it really matters what we think about if we're going to experience joy in our lives. And then he talked about right living. Well, today, I want to talk about what I think is the greatest secret of all of them, and it overlaps with the ones we've talked about. In fact, it's the heartbeat of the book. The secret is this, that ultimate joy is found in Christ. Ultimately, he, he is the, the heartbeat of it all. One day, everything is going to be wrapped up in Christ. One day, everything is going to be reconciled with Christ. But as Christians, we have the privilege of enjoying this relationship with Christ now. Let's begin reading in Philippians 4.10, and we'll see how Paul refers to a secret here. Paul wrote, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that once again you renewed your care for me. You were, in fact, concerned about me, but lacked the opportunity to show it. I don't say this out of need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know both how to have a little, and I know how to have a lot. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content. There's the word. The secret of being content. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. And then the next thing he's going to say is what the secret is. But let's stop for a moment. He talks about discovering the secret. Now, Paul is beginning this section by thanking, basically, the Philippians for the financial gift that they sent him. He acknowledges that I know you Philippians wanted to send this before to help me, but you couldn't do it for whatever reason. Maybe nobody could deliver the money, but now I've received it, and I'm really glad about it. I'm really joyful. I'm really grateful that you send this to me, sent this to me because in Bible times, if you were a prisoner but you had means, you could give money and it would improve your conditions, whether it be food or other things, it would improve your conditions. And so, so the book of Philippians, as I talked about the first week, is kind of basically a, a thank you letter. But Paul used this occasion to teach the Philippians something about contentment, about something about joy. He wanted them to understand that even though he was thrilled that they sent the money and, and he was joyful about it, even if he had not received it, he would have been okay. That he would have been content regardless. He says, I've learned, I've learned the secret of, of whether I have a lot or if I have nothing. I, I've learned the secret of contentment. Look at verse 12 again. He says, I know how to have a little, and I also know how to have a lot. 
in any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether I have an abundance or in need, which, by the way, I think a lot of people don't know how to do either. We do not know how to find joy when we don't have, when things are bad, when we don't have what we need. But we also many times don't know how to have joy or contentment when we do have a lot. We can't even find joy in that. And it relates to what we're talking about here, what the real key is. Now, when Paul said, I know how to have a little and a lot, uh, the scholar Dr. Jameson notes that the word I is emphatic in the Greek language in which this was written. Emphatic means he's trying to emphasize it. He's, he's saying here basically, I, I myself have learned this particular secret. This is not a secret that someone told me. I have learned it. And he's learned it through trial and error, as we'll see in a minute. Dr. Jameson translates it this way. I, for my part, have learned to be content in every state in which I find myself. Every, every situation in which I find myself, I've, I've learned this, this secret. Paul's contentment was not based on his circumstances, which we'll talk about in a minute as well. Dr. Leitner explains it this way. He said, changing circumstances did not affect the inner contentment he enjoyed. Leitner then goes on to explain what this word content means when he says, I've learned to be content. The word content means self-sufficient. The Stoics use this word to mean human self-reliance and fortitude, a calm acceptance of life's pressures, but Paul used it to refer to a divinely bestowed sufficiency, whatever the circumstances. Paul was saying, as we'll see, that by the grace that he received from Christ, he was able to face every single situation with fortitude. In the midst of all the things he was facing, he learned some lessons. Now, Paul is someone that could talk about contentment in circumstances that are hard because he went through a lot. I know some of us have been through hard times. Uh, some of you have been through really, really hard times, uh, a lot worse than I have. I've been through just enough hard times to know what they look like, and I've had my difficult times. But when I read Paul's story and what he went through, I think, wow, if you could find contentment in that, which he did. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 to 27, Paul talks about some of his experiences, some of the things he went through. He said, five times, five times, I received 39 lashes from the Jews. He was flogged, whipped five times. 39 was the maximum by law that they were allowed to use. I got the maximum there. Three times I was beaten with rocks by the Romans. Once I was stoned by my enemies. Three times I was shipwrecked. I've spent a night and a day in the open sea. I can't imagine that. You know, I've shared before the story when I went scuba diving and our whole group got lost. I mean, we were, we were not where we were supposed to be. And we're just dangling there. You know, I can't imagine a day and a night and you're thinking sharks and whatever else. He faced a day and a night in the open sea. He said, on frequent journeys, I faced dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the open country, dangers on the sea, and dangers among false brothers. Also experienced labor and hardship, many sleepless nights, hunger and thirst, often without food, cold, which I hate, and lacking clothing. And through it, he learned fortitude in the midst of it. Probably not every time and not perfectly every time, but he discovered a secret through the things that he endured. And the secret is this, Philippians 1.13, one of the most famous verses in the Bible, I'm able to do all things through him who strengthens me. That's the secret. I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. Me. And it's Christ there. Some versions actually put Christ there. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, I need to talk about a couple things related to that statement because some uh, get it wrong in terms of what it means. The statement does not mean, Paul's not saying here, I can perform miracles through Christ who gives me the power to do it. 
That's not what he's talking about here. He's not talking about, I can heal people, I can raise the dead, I, can, I could fly, I could do everything, you know? He's not saying he could do everything in that sense. What he's talking about here is his ability to face any circumstance. And commentators seem to be agreed on this, that I, I know what it is to be in a bad situation, I know what it is to be in a good situation, I can do it all through Christ who strengthens me. That's the sense. I can face anything, I can endure anything. If I have Christ with me and Christ's grace with me, I can, I can go through it. Second, it's important to understand that he's talking about the strength that Christ provides and not, not just his own strength. And I think sometimes we, when we're in the midst of things, we try to pull ourselves up by the bootstraps or we, we think, I need to be strong, and we try to fortify ourselves. Paul was not talking at all about a self-reliance here. He was talking about a Christ-reliance. He was talking about actually from a place of weakness. He talks about this in other places. Other places, he talks about the fact, I'd rather be in really bad shape. I'd, I'd rather be weak. I'd rather be persecuted. I'd rather suffer because when I go through those things, Christ's grace is in me. God's grace is working in me, and it makes me stronger. So when I'm weak, I'm really strong. This is the secret that he learned. A certain Christ sufficiency. One translator puts it this way, Christ infuses me when, with strength. Like when you think, I can't go another minute here. I can't face this thing. I can't endure this any longer. He infuses me with strength. That was the secret that he learned. And he had not just the strength of Christ, he had the Christ of strength within him, which both are important. I want the strength of Christ, but I want Christ himself. Elsewhere in chapter 4, the Apostle Paul talked about having the the, the peace of God with him, but then he talked about and the God of peace. And both are really important. We have Christ with us, but we also have the strength that Christ provides. Now, the question is, though, how practically do we grab a hold of this when we're going through these difficulties? How, how did Paul appropriate this secret? And I'd like to read verses 12 and 13 again, and I want to highlight three words because in talking about these words, I think it'll become a little clearer. He said, I know, in Philippians 4.12, I know how to have a little, and I know how to have a lot in any and all circumstances. That's the first word, circumstances. I have learned. That's the second word. The secret, that's the third word of being content. In all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. And here's the secret. I'm able to do all things through him who strengthens me. So let's talk about these three words. First one is circumstances. I think it's very important that we understand that our joy and our happiness, our contentment, should not be or cannot be attached to our circumstances if we are going to have true joy and happiness in life. I'm not suggesting here that, that our circumstances won't impact us. For example, if you're going through good circumstances, rejoice about it. I'm not suggesting it's wrong to rejoice about your circumstances. You should be happy. And if you're going through difficult times, I'm not suggesting that you can't struggle with it or or even cry about it or whatever else. I mean, that, that's okay too. What I am talking about here is that you cannot cling to your circumstances day in and day out for contentment and joy and happiness or you will be up and down like a yo-yo. Everything that happens to you, oh, I'm happy today, I'm sad today. Do we know people like that? Have you been that? I'm really thrilled today, you know, something happens. You get a pleasant surprise, and then the next day something bad happens, and then you crash. And if our joy is attached to our circumstances, we're not going to have this peace. And, and our, our happiness needs to transcend our circumstances. It needs to be attached to something that's bigger than our circumstances. And this is, again, where I think Christ comes into the picture. But Paul made the point, I've learned to be content regardless of the circumstances. The circumstances are irrelevant to how I'm doing. 
You know, people have said, you know, you ask the question, how are you doing? And the person responds, I'm doing well under the circumstances. The next response should be, what are you doing under the circumstances? That's, that's what Paul would say. He, he's learned to, to be happy regardless. When I think of tying our happiness and our joy to circumstances, the image that comes to my mind is that of a, a boat on, on the water, and maybe a small boat, and maybe the water's the ocean. And I see it being battered around. And even when the ocean is calm, it's being, you know, bounced a little bit by the waves. If you're in a boat, you know that's how that works. You're just kind of bouncing along there. But sometimes the waves could be really, really big, and so the boat is going up and down and up and down. And if our happiness is tied to circumstances, that's kind of what it's like. When things are going well, we're way up here. When things are going down, they're like that. Most of you have probably seen this picture by Rembrandt called The Storm on the Sea of Galilee. I, lo I love the picture. It so realistically captures the, what the disciples were going through, the fear that they had. It's realistic because one of the guys, actually, and you can't see it real clearly here, but one of the guys is throwing up, you know. And like, this is just a real painting. Now, I don't know if you remember the story behind this story from the Gospels, but Jesus was there in the boat with them. And this huge storm came up, which happens on the Sea of Galilee regularly because it's below sea level. I think it's like 600 or 700 feet below sea level, and these gusts come down, and you can have a storm out of nowhere. In fact, my first trip to Israel, we were going to go on the Sea of Galilee, and they canceled it. They said, we have to go tomorrow because the conditions are such. It could happen. It look, I looked, the sun was out. But Jesus is sleeping here, and they wake him up, and don't you care about us, you know? What the disciples didn't understand is that if Jesus is in the boat, nothing can happen to you. What's going to happen if Jesus is with you? That's kind of the point of the story. Now, my takeaway today is ultimate joy is found in Christ. And we attach ourselves to Christ, not our circumstances, but it's so hard to do that sometimes. The disciples had, of course, a lot of occasions where they were out on the water and something happened. And remember the one time they were, had been sent by Jesus ahead and, and the waves were against them, it says. So they were having really trouble moving. And these were professional fishermen or whatever, but Jesus comes walking on the water and, and um, they call out to him and, and Jesus says, it's me. You know, they thought it was a ghost. And then Peter said, well, if it's you really, Jesus, then call me to come out to you. I've mentioned before, all the disciples should have had that mindset that if you were following a rabbi in biblical times, you're not supposed to do what they teach. You're supposed to do exactly what they do. The last time I was in Israel, I was following a guy that was like a rabbi, and at a certain point, we were walking along, and he dove down into the water. We were walking fully clothed. It was a stream. He just shot for the water. I did too, because that's what you're supposed to do. All these guys could have walked on the water, but they didn't. So Peter goes out there, I'll do it. But you remember what happened. This is a perfect illustration of what happens when you look at the circumstances. He saw the waves, he saw the clouds. It was dark. He became afraid, took his eyes off Jesus. That's the problem. That's the problem. So we've got to get past our circumstances and see Christ, hold on to Christ. Second is the word learn. Paul said, I have learned the secret of being content. I just want us to understand about this, that his perspective did not come immediately, and it did not come naturally. It was something he had to learn. And so as he went through various things, I'm sure he wondered about it. Why am I suffering? God, where are you? Are you going to take care of me? Why does it have to be so hard? Why won't you answer my prayers? He, he, I'm sure he struggled with all of these kinds of things. And in the process, he began to learn that, that he could trust God. In fact, I believe he started looking at every difficulty as an opportunity. That's what James did, by the way. He said, when you look at the trials of your life, consider joy because there's, there's an opportunity here to grow. And for most of us, I think we would grow a lot more if we could learn in the difficult times to cling to Christ. How will we ever learn to persevere if we don't go through some of these kinds of things? How, how will we grow in our faith if we don't go through some of these kinds of things? And so it's this learning, learning process. And so what I'm encouraging you to do is as you face 
the good times, give thanks. As you face the difficult times, start viewing it differently. To cling to Christ in the midst of it, to learn through it. Like, what is it you're trying to teach me here? Where can I grow in this thing? Recognizing that, that you, don't, you don't have to face anything alone. But it is a learning process. But this is why Christians, as they get older, could become more, they're stronger and they're more mature and they're not blown around by things. They have a quiet confidence about them because they have learned. They've seen God's faithfulness over the years. And they said, I know it looks bad, but Christ has got me through all this other stuff in the past. I'm confident. And they move forward. The last word is secret here, I want to focus on. Secret is something that tends not to be obvious, and I don't think finding happiness in Christ as the object of our complete happiness is something people know about, Christians know about. But I think it's the most important thing. Now, this word secret is kind of key to the passage, and it's a word that would have resonated with the Philippians when they read it. Because it was a word that was associated in Paul's day with these mystery religions, these secret societies, even our day. In our day, aren't there these like secret societies and they kind of have these secrets and if you go through, you know, you're with them long enough, you learn the higher secrets or whatever. That's kind of the word that he's using. So Dr. Vincent puts it this way, the metaphor is from the initiatory rites of the pagan mysteries. So when Paul said he knows the secret here, he's saying, I have been initiated into this secret. I found some secret knowledge here through this thing. That's what he's saying. Dr. Leitner put it this way, secret was a technical term meaning to initiate into the mysteries. Paul used it here to suggest a kind of initiation by his experiences into being content when either well-fed or hungry and either in plenty or in want, Paul said he could do everything, including handling poverty and living in abundance through him who gave him strength. The key is being properly connected with Christ. Ultimately, our joy is found in Christ. And this comes back to what Paul said earlier in the book, and it's the theme of the book. Remember, Paul said, for me to live is Christ. That's it. Just in a word, what is my life? Well, it's not these things over here. It's not the good. It's not the bad. I'm passing through this world. My citizenship is in heaven. It's Christ. For me to live is Christ. And I suspect that when he had positive circumstances and things were going well, he just, had a, he just loved God and was grateful and filled with joy and, and had a little worship service. And then when, when he went through the hard times, I think he loved God and he had a little worship service. In my own life, the hardest things I've faced in life are the things where I got closest to God. Almost across the board. It's like I, I wouldn't want to go through that thing again, but I found Christ in the midst of it, and that's life. Because if you find Christ in the difficult times, you already have him in the positive times. That's a secret. That's a secret. And so Paul came to understand. He preferred his weaknesses, he preferred his struggles. So what do we do with this? Well, by way of application, I want to encourage you that when you're going through good times, when things are going well, to be grateful. I want to talk about that next week. We talk about the thanks part of Thanksgiving. We need to learn to be grateful and really thank God and enjoy what he's given to us. It's okay to enjoy what he's given you. It really is. And then when you're going through things badly, to look to Christ. I need your strength right here. To learn what it means to connect to Christ. And for that to happen... I want to encourage you to develop your relationship with Christ, to decide today, I'm going to develop that relationship. <clears throat> and, and you do it through the prayer, connecting with God in prayer. You do it through fellowship with other Christians, through reading your Bible, those kinds of things. This is what Jesus was talking about when he said, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Stay connected to me or, or you won't bear any fruit. Stay connected to me. And you'll, you'll see what life can be like when, as a branch, we're just connected to Christ. That's what Paul is talking about here. And I want to encourage us to start looking beyond our circumstances. 
Now let me close by just reading a few verses here that kind of wrap up the chapter, just for this kind of sake of completion. But I do want to read them because <clears throat> Paul comes back to this giving idea, and he mentions three things related to giving that I think are important. One is he talks about how God will reward us. Whether in heaven or this life, when we give, God rewards it. Second, that when we give to God, it's an offering, like, a, like an offering a lamb or a sacrifice to God. That's how he views it. And then third, there's a promise that God will take care of us when we care about the needs of other people. So let me close with these words from Philippians 3, 17 to 20. <clears throat> he said, not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit that is increasing to your account. In other words, for what's going to be deposited to you because you're giving to me. That's what I'm after, he said. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I'm amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you provided. It's a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And then he goes on with the promise, and my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that when a person puts their trust in the risen Lord Jesus Christ, the very spirit of Christ comes to live within that person. You begin to change us in the inside out. You begin to give us, the Lord, your love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, all the things that are associated with being connected with Jesus. You make us new people. Help us, Lord, though, to be ones who live according to faith. To not live according to sight, but to be able to face whatever circumstances that you put us through with this fortitude, with this contentment, to realize that we can trust you and that the strength your son provides is enough. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that concludes our time this morning. Look for an opportunity to put some of these things into practice. Hey guys, thank you so much for worshiping with us today. Just a reminder, go visit theridge.church slash kindness to see how you can be part of our kindness campaign. Also, if you're a veteran, don't forget to stop by the lobby to pick up a gift from us. And if you're watching from home, go to theridge.church slash veterans for info on receiving that gift. If this was your first time tuning in or you recently started joining us, we're so glad that you did. You can go to theridge.church slash next steps or head to next steps area in the lobby. We'd love to talk to you. If you have any prayer requests, we would love to be praying for you. So go to theridge.church slash prayer. Also, we have a new prayer plan for November. So you can go to theridge.church slash prayer plan to check it out. Have a great week and we're going to see you next time. Bye.